Welcome to ATP Report. We have a very special guest today. Daniel Greenfield is joining us. Uh, he is the Shulman Journalism Fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center. He is an expert on the subject we're going to talk about today, which is the worldwide persecution of Christians and why, if Daniel's going to tell us, nobody seems to be doing anything about it. It's a national and international tragedy of epic proportions, the likes of which the world hasn't seen in hundreds, if not thousands of years. And yet, nobody seems much to care. Okay, with that introduction, Daniel, thanks for coming on today. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure. So, it's a horrible subject. Um, President Trump has made it one of his issues to bring up that Christians around the world are subject to persecution, subject to murder, subject to the slave trade. Churches are being destroyed in amounts the likes of which haven't been seen in, if not hundreds, a thousand years or more. Tell us, why is it happening and why is nobody doing anything about it? First of all, we should call it what it is, which is genocide. And when President Trump came down to the UN, the UN wanted to talk about the weather, wanted to talk about its climate emergency. It wanted to talk about cow flatulence. It had no interest in talking about the mass murder of Christians. And yet President Trump came out there. He actually held a session discussing religious freedom, the religious freedom of Christians, of Jews. He mentioned that he had appointed a as uh, so on anti-Semitism, he also even discussed the religious freedom of uh, various other groups. Uh, but the point that he was making was that religious freedom is fundamental to a society, it's fundamental to the world, it's fundamental to every single country. And that is a subject, as you mentioned, that the UN does not want to talk about. Nobody wants to talk about it. Uh, President Trump mentioned that 11 Christians are killed for their religion every single day. Uh, that is a horrifying outrage, and statistically it's probably undercounted. Because in many parts of the world, in Asia and Africa and the Middle East, we don't really have good numbers. We don't even have good numbers, for example, than the, of the huge number of Christians who were ethnically cleansed in Iraq. Uh, we don't even have a very good read of the full number of Christians, how many returned, um, how many never did, in places like Libya, which Obama decided to make the subject of his a regime change operation for Islamists. Um, that is part of the reason why, of course, nobody actually wants to talk about it. Uh, the main source of persecution of Christians, not the only source, but the main one, um, is the Muslim world, specifically its Islamist governments. The Arab Spring uh, triggered a, really what you might call a genocide of Christians. It triggered persecution of Christians in Egypt, it triggered persecution of Christians um, in Iraq, in Syria, and really around the region. And this was very much tied in, obviously, to the Obama administration, to uh, this larger globalist perspective that we had to import democracy. Now, democracy means the majority rules, and the majority is Muslim. And the majority is Muslim, that means Christians lose their rights, it means they lose their freedoms, in some cases it means they lose their lives. Uh, this has led to a surge of church bombing, of Christians fleeing abroad, of a new wave of exiles, and the Obama administration actually closed the door on them. Under the Obama administration, for the first time, the majority of people claiming refugee status for religious persecution in the United States was no longer Christian, it was Muslim. Thankfully, under President Trump, that has been reversed. Uh, but this actually encompasses the truly horrifying thing that the Obama administration did. It not only triggered the persecution of Christians by empowering Islamists, it then closed the door on the Christians who were trying to escape persecution. Thankfully, we're seeing some reversal of that, but it also explains why there's been so much complicity and so much silence in that, because the media's been complicit in it, the Democrats were complicit in it, for that matter, some Republicans were complicit in it, and the larger sphere, the European Union, the United Nations, were very much complicit in this, and that's why the culture of silence continues. Well, fascinating. I mean, it, horrifying, but fascinating. I want to read you... Um, the new study that's out now, these are the 10 worst nations on planet Earth for Christians to reside in. North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, Pakistan, Eritrea, Libya, Iraq, Yemen, and Iran. All but one Islamist nations. Is that what you're talking about? And we should also point out that Korea is obviously horrible for Christians, but it's really horrible for everybody, as opposed to Muslim-majority countries, where you do have a political elite, and even beyond the political elite, a majority population that is more comfortable with some minority groups that are less comfortable. In North Korea, really, just about everybody is in a state of permanent terror. 
So is, is this, and, and I would agree, I mean, they always call North Korea, you know, the world's largest prison camp, and it probably is, and it's anybody that doesn't worship the latest Kim family member uh, who's running the country, because that is the state religion, worship of the ruling family. Yes. So I understand that as an anomaly. But the rest of these countries on the list, Daniel, are all countries run with Sharia as the law of the land. There is no exception. I'm looking at the list. These are not only Muslim countries, but countries that have implemented Sharia as the law of the land. Is that the nexus? That's an important point to make, and there's another modifying point that has to be made. When you look at the Constitution, the founding documents of virtually every Muslim country, they will say that Sharia law, Islamic Sharia law, they will sometimes specify is the principal source of legislation. It's a, all these countries have Sharia law. It's a question to what degree they implement it. And there's always somebody more extreme. We have a lot of talk about Islamic Mahathir, Islamic extremists. The reality is, um, from an American perspective, they're all extreme. Yet there are tiers of extremism. Thus, ISIS considers uh, lesser Islamists to be sellouts because they're far too moderate, and so on and so forth. You have Al Qaeda going after the Saudis because, of course, they were just too accepting, even though, again, they banned Christians, they banned churches. So it goes on and on. And other people who actually physically torture and murder Christians on camera, and all those regimes that will actually ban Christianity, they will raid. Um, Christmas celebrations and so on and so forth, but Sharia law is the driver behind all this. All this is because of the central idea um, in Islam that all other religions except Islam are illegitimate and that their practice should be restricted or disallowed in various ways. Um, when Islamist groups do outreach, they will say, you know, we're all people of the book, we're all Abrahamic religions, and practice when it comes down to it, they will insist that uh, Christians and Jews are all um, pagans, that they've taken partners uh, with Allah, that their monks and their rabbis have actually falsify the truth, and that actually gives them an excuse to begin cracking down, and even in some cases um, engage in violence against Christians and Jews. So Daniel, we can both agree the news is horrific, the numbers are bad and getting worse. Uh, as we just discussed, nine out of the ten nations that are leading the planet in persecution are doing so because they are Islamist nations run under Sharia. Uh, the other being North Korea, which is an outlier, and they hate everybody that doesn't worship the Kim family. Here's something I can't figure out. Damages to churches, especially in Europe, are multiplying at rates that have never been seen in modern times, especially in France, where literally hundreds of churches have been attacked with bombs, gasoline, um, windows broken, graffiti, uh, similar in Sweden, in Belgium, everywhere there is a large influx of Muslim population. And yet, for some reason, maybe you can explain, it's not a national crisis in these countries that are predominantly Christian. Why do you suppose that is? There's a common pattern, which is that churches and yes, synagogues are being attacked in cities that are increasingly driven by Muslim population, in some cases churches are turned into mosques, and in other cases they're attacked to drive them out. Now you call, now you said that these countries are Christian countries. Um, that's actually very much in dispute. When you look at the statistics, um, secularism, none of the above, atheist agnostics, which does not necessarily mean anti-religious in the agnostic case, but in practice, the majority of the population increasingly is not Christian, does not have any meaningful religious beliefs. And even when they identify as Christian, um, it's not really in the sense of believing in the doctrines of the Bible. It means that, well, we sometimes go to church and we discuss social justice and how bad the climate situation is and how we should do something about it and save the whales. It's not in the sense of actual belief of actual religious conviction. So these people might be, well, social Christians or cultural Christians, or if they had to pick some religion, they would pick Christian, but it's slightly better than no religion, and the affinity or affiliation they have for that religion is just above zero. They have no meaningful affiliation, and there are huge numbers of secular Christians and Jews who are on the left because the left is their religion. That's actually an important point because uh, your religion, it's your worldview, it's what you believe, it's what guides you, it's what you're willing to sacrifice for, it's what you're willing to fight for. When you look at what people are willing to fight for, increasingly it is their politics, um, it is particularly left-wing politics, and left-wing, the left and Islam have been aligned 
um, both dislike traditional religion, both dislike Christianity, they dislike Judaism, because they see them as rivals, while they see Islam as an ally rather than a rival. Interesting, and not very optimistic. So, last takeaway, is Trump going to be successful in his mission to save these hundreds of thousands bordering on several million Christians from persecution? Uh, that's a really big cause, and President Trump has made it very clear that he is a non-interventionist. That said, he's actually put it on the agenda. He's opened up um, refugee admissions to Christians, again, on account of... But uh, you, when you think in terms of the world Christian population, um, in Muslim countries, it is a very huge population. Parts of it are leaving, but still, um, the United States certainly can't save all of them or take all of them in. But we need to actually get serious about leveraging our foreign policy to say we are not actually going to tolerate um, persecution of Christians. This is going to affect our economic relationship, our political relationship. And maybe in some cases, uh, we could actually engage in a certain amount of military show force in extreme situations. Um, when you did have ISIS engaging in the massacre um, of Christians and non-Muslims, we did intervene. Uh, if a country, uh, for example, if Nigeria, um, under its Islamic dictator, were to begin massacring Christians, that is something I think we should actually consider military intervention on. Well, we'll leave it for there, and we'll come back soon to see what the next development is. I hope you're right. I hope Trump is successful. There's a lot of people that are important that we've got to do something about. That's our take today on ATP Report. Please text the word TRUTH to 88202 so you can get on our text mailing list, or go to our website, which you can get to easily by typing in findberry.com. That takes you to American Truth Project, and you can sign up there as well. It's always free. You'll get our daily videos and articles. You'll keep up with the news, and it'll never cost you anything. For ATP Report, I'm Barry Newsbomb.